uh, Wangari Mathai, the Kenyan Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Um, and uh, we were looking around and we were thinking about forests because of course, one of the reasons that Professor Mathai won the Nobel Peace Prize was for planting trees and recognizing um, desertification, loss of forests and the effect that that had on communities and health and the climate um, and water. Um, so we were speaking with um, somebody who had helped fund that film and we were talking about ecosystem services and corridors for animals to migrate north as climate change gets worse. And they asked us, have you heard about the biomass industry? And neither of us had heard about the biomass industry, I'm ashamed to say, um, because we thought that we were relatively well informed on environmental issues. And so we started looking into it and we were, we were, we were stunned. And we thought, well, here we are, we're stunned. So, you know, we, we got, this is what this film has to be about. And we can include, you know, ecosystem services and other aspects of, um, of, of what we were gonna include in, in the film we thought we might make. So that's how it began, just um, realizing that there was very little knowledge out there about this industry and what the detrimental sides of it were, which are pretty much all of them. So that's how it began. And then Chris has worked with us previously on um, other films and he was, he jumped in. It was um, April, 2015, I think. And um, he, he's been just incredible. Um, did a lot of research, traveled with us, went to the UK with us to look at Drax. And um, he's, he's been steady and really wonderful in the outreach aspect of it and making small and modules, which we've made um, that you can use in social media, all on our website. Thank you. So as, a, as another framing piece for people, um, I'm not sure it was clear. The film was made between 2015 and 2017, was finished. So it's been three years that we've been taking it to festivals for you know, I don't know, that was three or four months at the beginning and then into this outreach phase where we've done screenings. Um, uh, well, really all over the world, there have been about 150 screenings in those three years in the United States, uh, primarily in the Southeast, um, the Northeast, and then uh, in Hawaii also, where they used it to actually shut down uh, plans for a power plant on one of the islands. Um, and then internationally, uh, about 50% of them, a lot of them focused in uh, the UK around Drax, um, but also in other countries like Nova Scotia, they did a, they really used the um, film as a great organizing tool to to stop cutting in what they call there the crown forests, which are the forests that are basically owned by the government, the state, you know, the, the, uh, the forests of the people there. Um, and one other important framing thing is, and this was had to do with sort of our knowledge of pellets and biomass. Um, you know, when we came to the project, we, you know, I personally thought of biomass as being what we put in uh, residential, in our, in our stoves, in our pellet stoves at home. There's a lot of wood burning that goes on in New England and in Vermont to heat homes, but that's not, you know, just have to make it clear, that's not what the film is about. And we need to remember that people very easily slide into thinking about, oh, are all pellets bad? Are they all the same? And this is really about industrial scale electricity uh, generation. And, um, you know, we'll get into that, I think, in the discussion about, uh, you know, the difference between heating and uh, electricity generation in terms of efficiency. Um, and the power plant that doesn't get mentioned in the film that's in Vermont, which is McNeil in Burlington, which is considered to be renewable and kind of blindly accepted as being okay and part of their uh, sort of their great energy situation in Burlington. Uh, so 
Can you tell us what's happened since the film was released in 2017? Um, the subsidies in the UK have gone up to 136 billion pounds a year. Um, I don't think that has been changed in this version of the film yet. We have changed it. We are in the process of updating the statistics. And many of the pellet plants that um, are in the Southeast um, have increased their output. Um, and there are many more plants in the Southeast and there are ones um, under construction. Um, and Drax owns two major plants in Alabama or is it Mississippi or maybe both places. Um, anything else, Chris, updates? Well, yeah, you're covering the negatives, which is the, you know, the industry growth. I yeah. would have to say, you know, watching the NGOs who are campaigning against biomass in this country and around the world, I would say there's been a growth in them as well. And in media coverage, which just comes from sort of relentless kind of work by activists on the ground. And with that, there have been some victories, which maybe Rachel could even talk about, um, you know, on the uh, change regulations in the UK around CO2 uh, footprint and what's allowed now, um, divestment kind of uh, uh, campaigning. So Ra Rachel, do you, do you feel like yeah. to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, in the UK, there is definitely a growing awareness of the problem, um, especially among people and less so among policymakers. But the renewed uh, renewable energy directive in the UK did step back some from uh, the prior version as, as far as biomass, but not, not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. um, but I just would add to say that, um, and that um, this, this issue is not just limited to the pellet trade that's going on between uh, the Southeastern United States and British Columbia, which is the second largest source of pellets to Europe. Yeah, there are many other huge uh, power plants across Europe because Europe uh, had taken on commitments to reduce their emissions. And this was a big part of how they were gonna do that. But it's now become much more global. Uh, we have a really fast growing trade of wood pellets going into Asia and particularly Japan after Fukushima and uh, into um, Korea as well. And that's really taking off. Uh, just today, we had a conference call with some activists in British Columbia because that's where a lot of the Asian pellet exports are going, uh, coming from. Um, so this has really expanded globally a lot since, um, you know, since the film was made, uh, in spite of the fact that this has been a very useful organizing tool. Um, it has still been growing globally because, you know, when the rubber hits the road, politicians need to do something about climate change. And this is one of the sort of low hanging fruit for them uh, in terms of just being able to say that, uh, that they're addressing emissions in some way. Uh, they can convert coal plants without, as Duncan said in the film, without much infrastructure change. Trees grow everywhere. Um, they can be harvested 24 seven and burned 24 seven. So um, it, it is a problem that has grown globally and uh, very rapidly, very rapidly. And I think we need to be really prepared uh, to address it in a much more unified and powerful way than, than we've been able to do so far. I, I just wanna add one thing. I think that part of the reason that it's growing is because it is labeled renewable. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that needs to be removed from the biomass industry definition of um, you know, what they do. It's not renewable on any time scale that means anything for this planet. Yeah. I would just add that you know, one of the reasons I was excited to, uh, to uh, be involved with Standing Trees Vermont was to be fighting for the protection of forests and instead of against bioenergy because um, uh, we've worked really hard to fight back against this bio, biomass juggernaut, 
Um, and the thought was that if we could at least get some forests off limits to logging and protect it against that industries, uh, make it unable, them un unable to access these forests, that would be worth doing. So that's coming at it from another angle. Mm -hmm. So another question, um, what does Standing Trees Vermont hope to accomplish? We pass that one to Mark. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you want me to take that one. Um, I think we want to accomplish several things. Um, we want to first educate people and raise awareness about what's happening in the Green Mountain National Forest and in some of our state forests. The fact that logging is increasing, the logging plans are increasing. Um, if you see the picture behind me, this is from uh, a section of the Green Mountain National Forest. It's in the northern part of the Greens. It's in the Rochester area. Um, and this is part of uh, one of their timber sales. <clears throat> so we wanna raise awareness because a lot of Vermonters are not aware of what's happening in our, for in our, in our public lands. And we're focused on, we wanna be clear, we're focused on public lands that we, um, and that is our federal and our state lands not private lands. And we're not focused on um, anything other than trying to put these lands off limits to logging. Let them rewild, let them grow old, let them do the best they can for, uh, for ourselves and for our environment. Um, so we wanna raise public awareness. We want to um, talk to legislators and talk to uh, forest managers, both for the national forests and for the state forests to talk, talk to them about making policy changes, uh, making management decision changes to, to start looking at how to manage our public lands differently. Um, so, and, and then we uh, are looking at, um, would we like to take on some, uh, some sort of direct actions um, to see what we could do to try to stop these, these uh, logging plans and these logging actions that are taking place. So that's what we want to accomplish. Ultimately, we'd like to see our public lands, the forest on our public lands off limits uh, to logging. Thank you, Mark. We're getting a lot of really good questions. Uh, there are a number that have this, a similar theme. Uh, can you contrast large scale biomass burning with home heating by wood in rural Vermont? <sighs> I'll be happy to. Um at least start to address that. Um, I think it's a it's a you know a very nuanced. It requires a much more nuanced approach because we do need to heat somehow or other. Uh, we need to start out by figuring out how we can do that most efficiently. Um, but our choices are uh, that we have available right now are somewhat limited, and um, you know there are situations and places where heating with wood may make sense. Um, and places where it may not. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate to just have a blanket, um, everyone should heat with wood instead of gas or one of the other options, nor is it appropriate to have a blanket, never, never heat with wood. Um, it's a much more complicated, um, a much more complicated landscape trying to assess that, that and that's, you know, I think what we need to keep our focus on right now is is these very large scale uh, pellet trades and um, those are real clear no go territory. It is totally polluting, inefficient, not renewable energy. There's no question about that. When it comes to residential heating, or even commercial and other uh, other kinds of heating, uh, that's a much more complicated uh, discussion. And I I would leave it at that. And Rachel, to piggyback off of what you were saying, I didn't mean to give wood heat a free pass when I sort of was framing what the film was about. Um, and like you said, it is more nuanced, but as a, in a, on a kind of a scale issue, I was looking back in research uh, and I had a, a Vermont 2016 comprehensive energy plan and just to give people a sense of the difference between one power plant, the McNeil in Burlington, um, 50 watt power plant. Megawatt. Um, 50, me 50 megawatt, yes. Um, it can light one light bulb, it's a 50 <laughs> watt power plant. Um, and uh, of all the biomass used in the state, they used, in 2016, they used 90% of it. 
So all of the other uses of pellets and chips for biomass that would include schools, businesses, state office buildings, colleges, residences, that was 10% of the biomass. So you can you get a sense of the scale that of the amount of wood that's required to uh, as a as fuel stock for for uh, electricity generation it just blows everything else out of the water yeah i will add to that that you know epa recently um set new standards for emissions from wood stoves and um i upgraded my wood stove in my own home because i do heat with wood somewhat and i was amazed at how much more efficient and how much cleaner uh, that was. So there's a lot of things that even burning wood in for residential heating that can be done to improve how that's done. Because there's no question if everybody in the world decides to heat with wood, um, we'd, we'd have a lot of air pollution and a lot of uh, problems for supply. But uh, the, the commercial and industrial scale is, is, is a clear target we need to address. Mm -hmm. So here's another question. Um, I've heard the word proforestation. What does that mean? I'll take that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> give me just a second. I was, I was pretty sure that question would come up. So Bill Muba, who was in the film, was the one, he and some others um, did a literature review of a lot of really good previous research that was done around um, carbon sequestration, uh, how to effectively manage our forests, um, et cetera. And they came up with this term proforestation. And what it is is growing existing trees intact to their ecological potential, largely free from human intervention, except primarily for trails and hazard removal. So basically, other than for trails and for getting rid of hazards, it's letting the forests grow naturally. Um, this as opposed to terms like afforestation or reforestation, which can take years, um, a lot of money, and there may not be enough available land to, to uh, achieve what we need to do as far as CO2 uh, capture. Uh, proforestation is cheap. Let our forests grow. Let them continue to do what they, they do naturally. Um, our forests in the Northeast have not recovered. They are recovering. They've got many more years to go before they return to their former glory. So the idea behind back to what the standing trees are want to accomplish, we want to see our forests on our public lands be allowed to grow and, and, and um, be natural and not be managed. The Forest Service and uh, our state uh, forest uh, management, they want to actively manage these lands. Uh, and they come up with a lot of terms about why it's good to manage the forest as opposed to letting them grow naturally. And that gets to part of our education that we want to let people know that, that our forests are better off if we leave them alone. They capture more carbon. Uh, they uh, provide more uh, ecological benefits and biodiversity um, as opposed to if we try to put some man-made uh, management on top of them. So I hope that answers the question. So could you talk a little bit more about what the Forest Service is planning to do, the amount of clear cutting that is in the works and what people can do about it? Yeah, thanks, Annette. That's a good question. And um, so to give you an idea of what's happening in the Green Mountain National Forest, there are four forest pro uh, projects that have been approved. Uh, the Early Successional Habitat Creation Project, the Robinson Integrated Resource Project, the Somerset Integrated Resource Project, and the South of Route 9 Integrated Resource Project. Um, they all sound like they're good things. Early, early Successional Habitat Creation, Integrated Resource Projects. They all have very nice names to them. Um, you add them up and it's over 40,000 acres of logging within the Green Mountain National Forest. 40,000 acres may not sound like a lot from Western um, views. 40,000 acres is 10% of the Green Mountain National Forest. Within these plans, the Forest Service uses different terms for the type of cutting they're going to do. 
they do in their plans have uh, identified certain areas for uh, absolute clear cuts. And that's uh, somewhere between 600 and 700 acres. If I, uh, but some of it is still evolving because one of the projects they haven't yet identified all the types of clearing they're gonna do. But they use other terms like um, 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 early successional habitat creation um, or uh, what you see behind me. This is not called a clear cut. But if you look at this, I don't see many trees standing. They pretty much went through and just cut down every tree in sight. So when you, when uh, uh, the names that they use aside of that 40,000 acres, a good majority of it is gonna be clear cut type projects. So another question, how can I help let the forest service know that I don't support what they are doing? We'll take that one too. And we're gonna talk about this uh, when we wrap up at the end uh, because, um, and I'll, I'll repeat myself at the end too, but you know, many times when, when you attend events like this, you wonder what the heck can I do? This is, this is very interesting. I learned a lot, but what can I do? Um, there's a couple things. One is uh, we're starting a campaign for people to send letters to the supervisor of the Green Mountain National Forest and let them know that they're not happy with the management plan for the Green Mountain National Forest. And I'll talk more in detail about this at the end, but in case people drop off, if you go to our website, uh, we've got a link on, in there um, under the, I think it's the Get Involved tab, where um, we have information on uh, how to write a letter to the supervisor of the Green Mountain National Forest, um, addresses of where to send that letter, um, people that you should copy with your letter, um, and, and um, ideas, thoughts to help you write your letter. The, the Forest Service doesn't do a really good job of making the public aware of their plans. They announce their plans through things like a small ad in the Rutland Herald, okay? And they meet with people that they engage with on a regular basis, whether it's recreational clubs, whether it's the logging industry, but they don't do a very good job of reaching out to the public to let them know what they're planning. We want the Forest Service, the supervisor, to hear from the public that people are not happy with, um, with what's being planned. In, their, in your letter, you can request that they, um, that they give you a response to your letter in writing. So that's one thing. The other thing on our website um, is, it's under the contact us tab, um, or the take action tab. Again, I'm sorry, I don't have it up in front of me, but you'll see it on our website, which is in the, which is in the chat box right now. Um, you also can send us a message of if you'd like to get engaged, do you have any special skills or talents or something you'd like to do uh, to work with us as we, as we try to fight for protecting our public lands? So we're getting a lot of questions about politics. Uh, Senator Leahy, have we met with uh, Senator Sanders in Burlington? Uh, where is Ed Markey on this? Uh, what about the subsidies? So who would like to address the political problem? <laughs> well, um, I can start and hopefully others can help with that too. And there are other people in, the, um, in, the, in our audience here who can also contribute to that. I can say that, you know, I mean, Bernie Sanders was actually responsible for the McNeil when he was uh, governor here for the McNeil power plant um, in Burlington. And Mayor. I've tried many times to talk to him about it. I think uh, by now he kind of understands that it's not the greatest thing and maybe has some regrets about it, but um, doesn't really want to, doesn't not too eager to talk about it. Um, and, um, I, we are currently uh, contemplating how we might reach out to Patrick Leahy, because, uh, in particular around the Green Mountain National Forest area, because he has some um, particular relationship to uh, some of the areas that are that are um, slated for logging. So that's something that we've been thinking about how to do. Um, I will say I was, you know, a couple of days ago on a call with a bunch of people from the many different NGOs and organizations that have been working on this issue, talking about how to uh, engage with the current new administration on this issue. The EPA um, 
went through a process uh, some years ago of um, considering uh, how to deal with the emissions from biomass, the so-called biogenic versus fossil fuel uh, CO2 question. And there, uh, they had a scientific advisory board that went through, spent like three years um, studying the issue and concluded that, um, that it was a problematic and has never really taken action on that. Meanwhile, there's been a lot of, uh, and so there's some hope that maybe the new EPA might actually do what this scientific advisory bo body had advised years ago, and there'll be some pressure to do that. Um, we also talked about the fact that we have not ever had a champion in Congress at the federal level of any sort on this issue, um, other than maybe uh, um, Senator Markey at one point was uh, something of a champion, but it's been very difficult to get any traction on this. And part of that is because it is defined as renewable energy, um, people who support, you know, uh, understand that, that climate is a problem and support uh, policies for renewable energy, they feel that it would be divisive to try to split off the biomass from the solar and energy and wind that we need to have a united front politically in order to get anywhere uh, in, in, in the political sphere. Uh, so that's been the problem that we've been up against with that. As, as part of a response to the questions about what to do politically, um, you know, approaching, uh, I'll just add another perspective for folks, uh, approaching people at the top, you know, in a top down kind of way is one way to do it. So, you know, people in NGOs that are trying to push an agenda, uh, it's, that's an important tool. As important is uh, the bottom up approach. So all the folks, you know, the 200 folks that were on this call, which is about half the population of Vermont, I think, um, you know, write, writing letters uh, to the editor, uh, calling your uh, calling politicians and and uh, other bureaucrats in the state of Vermont, that's as effective. And I think both of those tools are important. So, you know, getting involved in that kind of way and um, learning more about the issue by visiting the various websites. You know, you can visit our the film's website, burnthemovie.com. We have resources, Biofuel Watch has resources on their website and a bunch of other groups that were represented in the film, Dogwood Alliance, NRDC. Um, and other then- Environmental Law Center. Yeah. So, um, you know, educate yourself and um, get involved in that way. I just encourage you to do that and be in touch with any of the groups that, uh, that I've just named uh, with questions about what what you can do. Without the subsidies, this industry would not exist. So that's a really, um, really something to go after. But of course, all energy companies get subsidies. You know, the oil, you know, the oil industry gets subsidies. But um, this one would go be gone without subsidies. And that's actually happened in the state of New Hampshire. Um, uh, or I, I live in New Hampshire, by the way, just over the border from Brattleboro. Um, and uh, our uh, Republican governor for of various reasons uh, vetoed subsidies to six smaller biomass plants that, that were in the state of New Hampshire. Meanwhile, the big one that's in the film, uh, the Burgess plant, which is a 75 megawatt plant uh, uh, up in Berlin, north of the White Mountains, is still being subsidized. But the other six, the subsidies were cut out and they closed down. And a similar thing happened in Maine. So um, that really is what's propping up the industry. Okay, I would, um, I'm seeing the time, it's uh, 8.15, and um, so I just want to ask the panel, is, is this a, the best time now, Mark, for you to give the wrap-up of uh, other actionable items of what people can do? Sure, and um, there's been some, I want to just quickly, because we are being very sensitive time, 
been some good questions and comments in the chat about our position on logging and wood products, et cetera. Um, we're not saying that we're against logging and we're not making any negative statements against wood products. What we're saying and what we're working toward is to protect the forests on our public lands. Um, the amount of forests that are protected from resource extraction is very small in the US and in the Northeast. So we're not saying to take forests out of production. We're just saying that there's a place to protect our public lands and allow them pro to provide the most benefit they can to us by allowing them to grow. There are many, many, um, and part of our education is to point out that there unfortunately is some incorrect information out there that cutting forests is good for them. Um, wood products do store carbon, but the process of cutting the forests, trans transporting the logs, manufacturing, et cetera, releases carbon, and the amount of carbon that's actually captured and stored long-term is very, very small related to if we left the forest alone. So we just want people to understand that there's a place for protecting forests on our public lands. And we wanna make people aware of some of the in, incorrect information that's put out there about why we should cut our forests because cutting our forests is not good for our forests. It's good for industries, but not good for our forests. It's not good for the plants and animals that depend on them. And it's not good for um, providing us with clean water and uh, protecting us against extreme weather events, which are going to happen over time. So I'll just drop it at that. Uh, I would like to say thanks for all the questions that were in the chat. Um, and I, I think it was very good and gave an opportunity for sharing, uh, sharing a lot of information. So, um, you know, a lot of what I was gonna say has already been said. I hope everybody found the film and the Q and A session educational. Um, as I said, when I go to a lot of events like this, I always at the end walk away thinking, what can I do? So I'll repeat what you can do. If you visit our website, which we've put in the chat box several times, but if you just Google Standing Trees Vermont, it's standingtreesvermont.org. Um, you go to our website and you'll find in there um, an opportunity to learn how to write letters to the supervisor of the Green Mountain National Forest and let them know what you think about their logging plans and what you think about their management plans. And also there's an opportunity that you can send us a message and let us know how you'd like to get involved. Uh, or if you'd just like to be on a list for future communications. We're a brand new group. We're all volunteers. We come from a lot of different diverse backgrounds, uh, but we have a common, common goal here. And that is we wanna protect our forests and our public lands. We haven't put together yet our communication strategy. We do want to uh, figure that out. And if you give us your name and you'd like to be on that list, we will, we will communicate with you in the future as we work on that. Um, it's under the Get Involved tab on our website. I'm sorry, I was struggling to remember where it was. <clears throat> After this event tonight, we are gonna send out one email and only one email to everybody who registered for the event. And that email is gonna contain information about what I just talked about. Uh, the letter writing campaign. It'll provide you links to our website and our Facebook page. And as I said, at our website under the Get Involved tab, you can get information about letter writing or you can send a message to us. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, you can watch our website and our Facebook page for announcement about future events. Um, I'd like to say, take care everybody, stay healthy and get out and enjoy the forests that are near you. Hey, Mark, could we have a last word? Absolutely. You have three or four last um, I, words. I just saw in the chat someone asking about uh, links to the film. And so at burnthemovie.com, which is the website, on the homepage is a link to the 30 minute version that is free for anybody to watch at any time. The film is also, uh, we have a 45 minute version that's really tailored to uh, the Europeans. Um, and the UK situation. And the original film is actually a feature length, uh, 74 minute film. And you can find out how to watch those versions on the website. What did I forget, Lisa? 
Um, just you did mention that there is a resource tab on our website that has, for example, the article that Mark was referring to by Bill Mumon, Susan Messino, and Edward Faison, and a lot of other um, articles that, and we continually add new new information there. And also, I think I said this before, there are 21 modules about biomass that can be used for social media. They're all like a minute, minute and a half or something like that. But there's a lot of, um, a lot of good information there. And we are actually gonna be putting all versions of the film for free on YouTube as fast as we can, so. Thanks for watching. Yeah, thank you. Um, may I ask a question about, there's so many great questions in the chat. Will they be saved or? I've, I've saved them all and I guess we'll figure out what to do with them. Okay, okay, good. I've made a point of saving them all because I agree that they're really good questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Annette. That's good because we can't obviously get to them all but there's yeah. some great- I have a list of 51. Well, there's 99 plus new messages I've got here. So maybe they're not all questions. They're not all questions. <laughs> Thank you, who, all you people out there for Thank you. attending tonight. Thank you yeah, very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to everybody who attended tonight. It's very inspiring to see so many people here. Thank you. Yes, it is. Thank you for helping us help each other. Great job. <laughs>